back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. We are perennially uh, being reminded, as we should be, of the tragic situation in Israel and Palestine. It seems to be in the news for a variety of reasons recently, perhaps not enough for the most important reasons of all, but we'll get into all of that with my next guest. James Zogby is the founder and president of the Arab American Institute here in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is also a longtime activist on this subject and very involved in politics, polling, and other fields as well. Um, but without any further ado, James Zogby, a welcome back to the program. Thank you, Richard. Let me explain what I meant in that introduction there. We've been hearing a lot, and there's been some good uh, writing on this topic recently in uh, by Philip Weiss and others. We've been hearing a lot uh, within the Jewish American community, which I come out of, uh, about concerns that Israel is turning fascistic. And so that's been, uh, you know, some of the moves by the new Netanyahu government, the new cabinet that he's formed, uh, are causing a lot of this discussion. And uh, what this struck me about what you, you and I talked about briefly the other day was uh, there was an era in which, uh, decades ago, in which it was felt, I think, by most people uh, in the United States that while there may be oppression of the Palestinians, that there was something approaching a liberal democracy in Israel and that there were uh, reasonable people within the context of that country's founding, running the place. And um, now there's a feeling that, you know, the, uh, the barbarians have taken over, but that uh, there is a democracy to be restored there. And I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did my doctoral dissertation on the period of the founding of the state and what was uh, during the period called the Nakba, the expulsion of Palestinians uh, to create, as Ben-Gurion said, a state that was more uh, more Jewish, had more land and less Arabs. Um, it, it was actually in its founding, uh, Zionism was in its founding, uh, a problematic movement. There were several threads to it. Uh, there was a religious component, a spiritual component, I'd say, Martin Buber, that thought that, yes, it's the spiritual home of the Jewish people, but there are other people there, and we've got to recognize them as equals, not as others, and, and deal with them uh, in, a, in a respectful way. There was also a, a secular Zionist movement um, that was very similar in the mutual respect and equality of rights, etc. And then there was the political Zionist movement that taught the, that s modeled itself after the the, the colonial uh, movements of Europe. Uh, Theodore Herzl went and uh, spent time with Cecil Rhodes. How do you do it? He wanted to know how, how does it done, and wrote. If you look at some of the passages in his writing. He talks about, uh, you know, spiriting the penniless people across the border, uh, the, the indigenous people. After they've cleared the snakes and gotten rid of all the junk from the frontier, we then get them across the border because it was a home for us, not them. Uh, they were viewed as others, not equal in any way, shape or form. And um, uh, and so it was a like Britain, like France. Uh, it was a liberal democracy for the British and the French, and in this case, for the the, the Zionist settlers. Um, the threads of spiritual Zionism and, and secular Zionism remained, but diminished in time uh, as this political current grew um, and was enabled by the, the, the guilt of the West and by the, 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 the coddling of the West, I'd say. Uh, so much so that, that ultimately it took hold not only as the the dominant movement, but it, with a sense of impunity. It operates with a sense of impunity so that, you know, th they would uh, do things and the U.S. would say, well, that's not a good thing to do. And they do it anyway. Uh, then they do other things and the U.S. would say, you shouldn't do that. Uh, and they do it anyway. And after getting away with doing these things for decades, um, that what's taken hold is a sense that we can do whatever we want um, and no one is going to stop us. So 
uh, I, I, I've in just my my political lifetime, I've lived through multiple settlement freezes that were devices used by the Israelis to to get the Americans off their back for a few months, and then as soon as they felt that the coast was clear, they'd go and build. Bill Clinton, for example, said, "Do not build on Jabal Abu Khanaim, which is a mountain between a hill between um, uh, Bethlehem and uh, and Jerusalem." put his foot down. He was very fervent about it. Uh, today, there's 22,000 settlers living on that hill. It's called Har Um, uh, And that's the same with many other settlements in the area. Um, when violence began to occur, the U.S. would turn away and, and ignore it. Uh, when religious freedoms of Christians and Muslims were violated, the U.S. would tisk and then turn away and do nothing. Giving way constantly to the the worst instincts of the political Zionists created, yes, a sense of impunity. It also weakened the, the, the ability of those who had an alternative view, a more tolerant view, uh, to gain any traction. So that today, there is no real peace movement in Israel. And the big demonstrations that are taking place are great, but they're about saving Jewish democracy, about saving the constitution uh, checks on the, the prime minister, um, they're not about equal rights for Arabs. They're not about seeing uh, the Arab citizens of Israel or certainly not the Palestinians as having equal rights. Um, the Jewish nation state law that got passed makes it clear this is a state for the Jewish people only. Uh, Netanyahu has been very clear, as has most of his cabinet. And I would say most of the Knesset, uh, maybe 80% of the Knesset, uh, shares that view. They may not like Netanyahu, they're not in his government, but they share the view that this is the state for us um, and the Palestinians have to go. Um, and that's taken hold in public opinion so that, you know, um, today there, 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 there isn't a tolerance for Palestinians. And the result is, is that as Israel became more extreme, the Palestinian response was equally extreme. And you've got now um, a situation completely out of control. And the best the U.S. could offer in this Aqaba summit that was just held was let's calm things down. Well, you can't calm things down when the Palestinian Authority has no control anymore because people are furious with it. They say, you've never gotten us anything. You've gotten us deeper into this hole. And at the same time, Netanyahu doesn't have any control over his government, um, so much so that as soon as the summit was over, uh, and one of the agreements was a settlement freeze, which I never believed was going to happen. He said there was no settlement freeze. Um, and settlers rampaged in a couple of Palestinian communities and uh, injured hundreds and destroyed homes. And and uh, the response of his cabinet minister who was in charge of that said that village, the Palestinian village, should be wiped off the map. Um, that, that's the mindset that's there now. And it's very disturbing, very disturbing. And, and it's a war by the majority of the demonstrators in Israel and by the American Jewish mainstream organizations who are, yeah, we're concerned about um, the uh, the whole issue of, of democracy for us, but they're not concerned about Palestinians. Has this, you think, I don't want to overly dwell on the past, but, uh, you know, to me, in my recollection, there were several phases. I remember being a small child and being taken to see the movie Exodus with Paul Newman and the theme song, This Land Was Mine, God Gave This Land to Me, which in retrospect uh, sounds fanatical, to be honest. You know, this... Uh, uh, well, the funny thing about that movie was that it was funded by um, an individual who saw it and the book that it was based on as the perfect example of of Hasbara, of, of Israeli propaganda. And it was designed as that. The Israelis were the blonde, blue-eyed uh, folks on the frontier, and the Arabs were the savages who were trying to block them. It was modeled after cowboys and Indians back when, <laughs> when in, right. in our recollection, our childhood Indians were the bad guys. And the, all the pioneers wanted was to carve out a place on the frontier so they could live with peace and freedom and have their families grow. And these savages were coming and threatening them. Well, that was the model. That's how Israel saw it. You know, in the 1930s, the Zionist movement called the Palestinians Red Indians. Um, really? And Arab, in, in a speech he gave at the UN, 
um, that was the Israelis just went, bers- you know, it was berserk. They, the, the comments afterwards were, today, bestiality has come to the United Nations. That's how they talked about Arafat. But he said, we are not Red Indians. And nobody knew what he meant. And it was in reference to that 1930s um, designation that the political Zionists had put on Palestinians saying they're like Red Indians. Uh, They have to be, they're savages. They have to be expelled. One of the early founders of Zionism, the political Zionist movement, a colleague of Herzl's, said that uh, this was a, it wasn't, as Biden says today, democracy versus authoritarianism. It was between barbarism and civilization. We are the forces of civilization. They're the forces of barbarism. Which and, is the uh, classic colonialist that, presentation, right? That, you, that, you, you know, in, in a way, you can't blame them. <laughs> they grew up in that world. I mean, this is right. a European movement. Political Zionism is a European movement that grew up in the period when Britain and France and, and Germany and others were colonizing Africa, Asia, uh, and uh, uh, in the Middle East. And uh, the British saw the Egyptians know better. The, the, the You know, when... After World War I, the idea was, what are we going to do with the Ottoman uh, territories that were that were conquered? Um, the, the Palestinians, the Arabs, had an agreement, they believed, with the British, that if they joined the, the front against uh, the Axis powers, they would be given independence. Um, the British had no intention of doing that and made a separate agreement with the Zionists to give them Palestine and an agreement with the French to carve the territory up into nation states that were not nation states because they were all Arab. They made Syria and Lebanon and Jordan, Transjordan and Iraq, etc. Um, Wilson, who despite his horrific flaws as, a, as an American segregationist, um, enunciated the the principle of self-determination and so sent over a group uh headed by uh two people king and crane the king crane commission to conduct the first poll in the arab world in the middle east and uh they uh at the end of their poll they concluded 80 percent wanted a unified region um the levant they wanted it one region uh they didn't want a british or french carving up of the area um, and they didn't want a Zionist implant in Palestine. They wanted it to be part of the region. Uh, my father used to talk about how he'd go from, you know, they could go from Lebanon to Egypt, just they just cross. And, uh, you know, there there are Zogbys in Bethlehem, there are Zogbys in Lebanon, there are Zogbys, you know, it was all one, one, one unified area. Um, in response to that, um, Balfour, who issued the Balfour Declaration, he said, the opinions and views of the indigenous people mean nothing to us. They are not as important as that of the Zionist movement that we've embraced. That's what he said. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the indigenous people never mattered to the colonialists. Uh, their ambitions trumped. And, uh, and the consequences of the Sykes-Picot agreement, that division and the implant of the, the Zionist, they're still with us today. Um, and still it, with it, us. If we look at the, uh, uh, James Zogby, if we look at the liberal America, I don't mean this in any negative or, uh, you know, but uh, a stereotyping way, but if we look at the sort of history of American liberalism uh, post-World War II, I I think there was a long, I mean, I think again of my parents and their friends as an example that there was a set, first of all, the other term phrase that we used to hear uh a land without a people for a people without a land right you know entirely people uh, like that who would be horrified at the idea that they were supporting a colonialist project of any kind were told well it's simply empty uh so there was that phase and then i would say there was a later phase as as after the six-day war and so on where okay but there are people trying to make it better there's you know name the leaders you want to name you know shimon uh shimon perez or whomever yitzhak rabin uh at least they're trying to do something and uh, there was that belief for a long time but as you pointed out a few minutes ago uh it's never resulted in substantive uh changes in the situation there so were people in this country 
like them misled about what the project really was? Deliberately, with the deliberately so. They were deliberately misled. It was a propaganda effort from the very beginning uh, to deny the existence uh, of the, the people uh, and to deny their humanity once recognized they were savages. They were less than us. Um, and um, and that's still the case. I mean, Hasbara didn't Israeli propaganda didn't just begin now. Um, it's been there from the the very outset. Um, one people is more important than another. And you know, it, it, the Israelis and their supporters here in the states wax indignant over apartheid, the, the designating Israel apartheid. But when a system is constructed to benefit one people over another. To see one people as more worthy of rights than another, uh, there's no other designation for it. When it's founded in law and in practice, then it's apartheid, and it's been that from the from the outset. I mean, if you look back to the to 1948, just starting in 48, not before, um, the the system of laws that were imposed by uh, the early Israeli government, the first Israeli government were the emergency defense laws. They put in place the emergency defense laws to govern the Arabs, the remnant of the Arab population that was left. Now, what's interesting about those emergency defense laws was that they had originally been passed by the British to govern the unruly Zionist militia that had start, begun to strike out against them after 1945 when the, the, the Zionists were beginning to make their play for independence and um, and the British put these laws in place that provided mm -hmm. for. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Jim, but you mean, for example, the Irgun, the uh, Menachem yeah, Begin, the, Irgun, the Haganah, the Stern Gang, and and others. Yes, the, um, the, they um, the, they provided for uh, administrative detention, holding people without charge. They provided for collective punishment. They provided for the seizure of properties. They provided for a whole range of practices. Moshe Sharet who uh, was uh, a leading uh, jurist uh, in the in the Zionist uh, movement in the in the 40s said there were no such laws in Nazi Germany that's what he said they were an outrage no such laws in Nazi Germany in 1948 with the creation of the state of Israel on mass that body of the emergency defense laws were imported <laughs> and put in place in the Galilee region to govern the Arab population they took their land um, they used collective punishment. They used administrative detention. They denied them a whole range of rights. They couldn't join unions. They couldn't join political parties. They, it was, you know, it was just an outrage. Uh, that was from the very beginning. But while we're celebrating the independence and the, you know, whatever, uh, the, the remnant Arab population was ground into the dirt um, and rose I have a book I wrote called Palestinians, the Invisible Victims. It traces from, it's a short book. It's only like about 80 pages long, but it starts with the founding of the Zionist movement, the 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 period of the mandate, the the Nakba, and then it goes on to today. And the treatment of the, the Arabs in Israel uh, and the governing of them with the emergency defense laws remained in place until 1966. Um, and in 66, they were ended. But then as soon as the occupation started in 67, that same body of laws were then uh, transferred to the uh, to the, the West Bank. Um, and if you look at the map of the West Bank and you see these circles of, you know, the, the Nablus area and the Hebron area, whatever, uh, and the land all around them has been taken. That's exactly what was done in the Galilee region, where Nazareth, became an uh, uh, enclave, um, lost all the land that they owned around it. They were strangled in this little community. They couldn't buy property because once the, the, the Jewish agency took land, it could never be reverted to non-Jewish ownership. In fact, in the early years, it couldn't be worked on by non-Jewish uh, workmen. Um, and, uh, uh, and the the Arab community became impoverished, became a dependency, both the ones in Israel, but then later on in the West Bank. And so what you have now is that the single largest source of employment in the West Bank are day laborers in Israel or on settlements.
They've made them into, as Yuri Lebrani, who was the first minister for Arab affairs in the early Jewish state, said, we'll make them hewers of wood and bearers of water. They'll do our dirty work. They're like the 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 um, the the Shabbat goy, you know. Right, right, <laughs> They'll do right, all right. the dirty work for us, and yeah, you know, and that's the that's a, the, the tragic reality is that it's never been understood or recognized here. Uh, honestly, if people want to read the Invisible Victim, Palestinians, the Invisible Victim, uh, I think it's a it's a useful it's a useful handbook to understand. This didn't just come out of nowhere. This has been there from the beginning. Um, and it struggled with an alternate theme, the the spiritual and the, the secular Zionists uh, who lost. And they lost, I think, because the West coddled the political Zionists, gave way to them. And so the if there were ever to have been a truly liberal, open movement, it we sucked the life out of it by never giving it any support. If we'd ever said and meant it, you may not do this and there will be consequences to bad behavior, we would have strengthened the alternative voices. We never did. And we still don't. You know, one of the things, and this is probably not a fair question to direct to you, probably fairer to direct to me, actually, but I'd be curious to know your thoughts on it. I, I think of the example of my own godfather. We called him Uncle Marty. Jim, you and I are from Utica, New York. If the Zogby family ever bought furniture from Ethan Allen Furniture, Utica, New York, you bought from my Uncle Marty, okay? And Marty was a wonderful man and uh, lovely and liberal and kind and generous. And he moved to Israel, Tel Aviv, in the mid-60s. And he came back saying the most hateful thing about Arabs, mm. hateful things about Palestinians. And I'm just wondering what happens, you know, to how people are reprogrammed like that. It's learned, it's learned behavior, and it, it's not exclusive to that. I mean, I was in Lebanon in 1971, and I remember my relatives talking about Palestinian refugees and the way they talked about mm. Palestinians. Uh, I remember them the way they talked about Syrians. Um, and uh, and it it's a it's unfortunately it's a part of our human nature. <laughs> yeah. we, we make other of people uh, that that frighten or concern us. Uh, uh, we make them less than us. I mean, we you know we had Jim Crow here. Still not done with it. Uh, we're we're doing it today with uh, with gay, lesbian, trans people. Uh, we we uh, it is part of our nature to do that. The problem is is that. Um, do you coddle it or you do you confront it and when you coddle it uh you give it free reign and when you give it free reign it becomes normative it's 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 accepted um and actually anyone who violates that norm <laughs> then becomes an outcast right so if i say um uh zionism in practice is a racist movement uh because it is in practice uh i become an anti-semite and I become right. somebody who has to be squashed um, and and treated as a, as an abomination. That that tendency um, is with every nation, every people, <laughs> and it's it's uh, the question is how do you deal with it? Do you, as I said, do you give it free reign? Do you coddle it, or do you confront it? And and precisely because there was no, I don't want to say adult supervision, but there was no there was no one in the West who was saying, you cannot say that. You cannot behave in that manner. You cannot take those homes, demolish them, build on their land, violate international law, violate international conventions, uh, and get support from us. We would have strengthened alternative voices who would have said, wait, you know, guys, let's think through what we're doing here. I mean, um, uh, the civil rights movement didn't end racism, but it put sanctions on racist behavior to the point where a different generation could grow up with some different attitudes. I mean, you and I remember growing up thinking gay people were some freaky something or other, right? Yeah, and sure. uh, enough social sanctions developed and enough that we began to recognize, well, wait, I think that's my cousin. I think that's my child. I think that's, you know, and, 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 um, but if there's nothing, if there's nothing to say, don't do that, uh, then, bad behavior takes hold and becomes the norm and that's where we are right now um well that gets it's, us you're right it's good people it's good people um 
living in a you know you you put you put a, a healthy goldfish in a in dirty water going to get sick um you know yeah well that gets us you know in the few minutes we have left to the uh, to the present right we we have i've i've had some hopes in recent years that uh, you know the political needle was moving on this jim you've been an activist on this issue for many years with extraordinary i would say patience and diligence on a you know a challenging hill to climb to get people to address this issue in this country politically and you know i've been optimistic the, the number of poll numbers are changing among young people young jews other people uh we're seeing you know a little bit more discussion of the issue both sides of this issue at least in 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 politics but i've also been a little disappointed especially in the last election cycle with the enormous infusion of money that was thrown into democratic primaries and so on and i'm afraid that this I don't know if you shared my perception that there might be an opening forming, but then I'm afraid that, you know, it's being assaulted with, you know, we've had yeah. some people, Summer Lee won, but uh, her primary, but Don Edwards lost series and so on. Um, and that a sort of climate of fear is being reinstalled that you just can't speak up on this issue. I, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Look, uh, the, the, there reminds me sometimes of the, the, the little Dutch boy in the, the hole in the dike, you know, um, the, 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 it's spring and a leak. Uh, there's no question that uh, public opinion is changing, and that's irreversible. Irreversible. Um, there is a new consciousness developing among people um, because they see the world in a bigger way than earlier generations, and they're not as willing to accept the notion of inequality of of intolerance uh, in in the same way that's real um we saw it in the bernie campaign we've seen it now in the emergence of a whole progressive movement in the jewish community i mean i went to the last j street conference they're struggling struggling to deal with the fact that they see they see crap happening and they don't they, they can't they're not comfortable with it it violates all the norms that they have developed as a as a liberal social conscience movement given that uh you're right there has been a, a powerful assault from the right, um, both in terms of huge amounts of money to destroy people and also laws, you know, um, right. making anti-Semitism, um, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, criticizing Israel becomes anti-Semitism. Anti 30-something um, uh, states have anti-BDS laws. Um, um, and, and, and that's all been part of this assault on an irreversible change in consciousness. Um, how long that will remain before the dike breaks, I don't know. But uh, and you know, but but I see it. I, I know one thing that Democrats uh, who are in office, who are taking the position that they used to take uh, ten years ago, are completely out of sync with where the base of the Democratic Party is today. Will it become a decisive issue? Will it be something that will unelect people? I don't think yet, but I think we're getting to the point where people are going to have to make a decision. Um, and like I said, not yet. And so you do get, you were talking about Katie Porter before. This is a strong, smart, progressive woman who said the dumbest things when she went over to Israel um, and embraced Netanyahu and as a thoughtful whatever. I mean, nobody in their right mind would call him a thoughtful whatever. He just was in Italy, <laughs> going to Italy, where he just said to the the, the neo-fascist, um, his his counterpart there, oh, that history belongs to the strong. Now, who says history belongs to the strong when you're in a neo-fascist government in Italy, where Mussolini literally coined that phrase? Right? Um, it, it, it's it's anyone should be re repulsed by that right um but it's it's going to take work <laughs> and it's going to take people having to pay a price for it um a price in terms of losing an election well, i don't think we're there yet but i think that you know you, you can throw all the money you want but i think it's going to lose and I, I and i look you're right i've been doing it a long time i find myself sometimes comparing my my work to sisyphus you know i've been rolling the stone up the hill it keeps rolling back down there's right. nothing to do but just pick it up and start rolling it up again um, and, and I see change, 
it's easier to roll these days. Uh, when I first came to Washington and I tried to join political coalitions, I was excluded. First meeting at the Carter White House with Mondale, three days after the meeting, I was called by the White House to say, we can't have you back again because you're pro-Palestinian and, and some groups, the ADL, objected. Um, 16 years later, I'm invited to the Clinton White House to the same ethnic leaders meeting, and they asked me to be one of the co-chairs of the, of the group. Progress is being made. We're changing on the ground. It's not fast enough. I'd like it to be faster, but I do see change. Um, and uh, uh, and groups like J Street and JVP and Ben the Ark and 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 uh, um, if not now, these are evidence of the fact that there's something real going on. And I'm pleased to to see it happen in my lifetime. Well, I'm glad we're able to end. On that note, given, uh, you know, the daunting challenge. So James Zogby, president of the Arab American Institute, thanks for all your great work Thank and you. thanks for coming Thank on the so program. Much. Oh, wait, well. one thing. If people, sure. if people want to, to uh, follow me on Twitter, it's JJZ1600, uh, JJZ1600. And they can also DM me and uh, if they're interested in the book, um, the Palestinians, the Invisible Victims, or they can find it online. It's available. Thanks. Excellent. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, bye. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Askow, and this is The Zero Hour.